My Auntie Jo is a very easy person to write about. I, I found out really quickly as I started sort of putting some thoughts together about this, uh, what I was going to say. Over the past 60 years, she's developed a personality that is unique to her own and lends itself to compliments. Outwardly, Josephine is an industrious, intelligent model of fortitude and devotion. When you know her closely, as many of us in this room do, you realize quickly that those characteristics are a small piece of this very dynamic person. Josephine has always struck me as someone who lies beyond her years, and I've often, as I'm sure many of us have, come to her for sage advice. One of, her, uh, one of her greatest attributes is her compassion. She has a level of compassion and caring that is unequal. Her life has been one of dedication to those she cares about. Whether that was the multitude of kids and children that she taught as a school teacher, or the four that she currently teaches every day. Uh, Josephine, <coughs> Auntie Jo, yet uh, deepened my appreciation for life in a way that I never could have predicted. Each day I strive to be a little bit more like you. <clears throat> to love and care more passionately for my, ch my children. To be patient and kind to those I encounter. <clears throat> to remember that life is about hard work and commitment. <laughs> to never forget that the innocent and well-timed use of minor profanity on your outgoing voicemail message can bring so much happiness to so many people. <laughs> Anyone that has never got uh, my Auntie Joe's voicemail, uh, I'm sure it's going to be ringing off the hook tomorrow, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's probably one of the funniest outgoing messages I've ever heard. And so, um, I had to put that <laughs> To summon strength that I never thought I had, To focus on the simple joys of a cup of coffee, a fresh tortilla, or a fried egg. To, rel to relish the time I have with those I love. To listen intently when someone is speaking. To search for triple word scores when I play Scrabble. <laughs> to soldier on in the face of what seems like overwhelming adversity. To appreciate the fact that no matter how much I learn, you still manage to teach me something nearly every time we talk. To laugh, to love, and to care. Thanks to your presence in our lives, we're all better people. My name is Josephine Diaz. I was born on March 19th, 1953. My dad's name was Reuben. My mom's name was Sally. My mom was very strict. My dad was very laid back, very calm. Um, my, uh, my mom was boss. Whatever my mom said, that's what happened because he didn't argue with her much. Um, he let her do the disciplining. Um, he just, he'd go to work every day, he'd come back. He was very loyal, uh, a very quiet man. Uh, my mom loved to play bingo. She loved bingo. Oh my gosh. She would even take people with her to the bingo. They'd pay her a dollar a piece. That's how she played bingo. I was born in in those days there was a lot of natural childbirth so I was born on the front porch at my grandmother's house we lived in Roswell till I was eight years old then we moved here to Los Lunas we lived in a small home um, not very well off middle class maybe uh, my dad worked all his life I have two sisters, Eloise Orona and Alice Underwood. Alice and I were closer because we were closer in age. Eloise is seven years younger than I am, so uh, she came along later in life. She was the baby of the family. My mom had a little flower garden 
beautiful flowers. She should take care of her flowers all the time. <laughs> Alice and I, uh, we decided one day that we were going to make soup with the flowers. So we picked all the flowers, not the stems, just the flower, the petals, and we put them in a soup <laughs> pot and we made soup. And when my mom came home and she saw her flower garden, she had a fit. So our punishment in those days, I think there was like two or three trees around our house. She'd make us water the trees. We'd have to put water in a bucket and water the trees. That was our punishment. But she was very upset with us because she worked very hard. And she was very proud of that little garden. But. I, you know, we had it. We had an outhouse. We didn't have inside uh, an inside bathroom. So she, uh, Alice was playing. Alice and I were playing around the outhouse, not knowing that my mom was in the bathroom. And Alice said a bad word, and my mom came out of that outhouse. We didn't know she was in there. She came out of the outhouse. She took her inside, washed her mouth out with soap, and she was, a, a, you know what she had to do? She had to water the trees, because that was our punishment. <laughs> Making the effort of having to fill up the bucket, carry it to the trees, water the trees, and it's not, it wasn't just one bucket, it was several bucketfuls that we had to do. Not until we moved over here to Los Unas. Then we had, in those days, we had to pump water out of a pump outside. We had to prime the pump, actually. Pour water in there, prime it, pump it, um, get the water, take it inside. We had a wood stove, so we had to gather wood for the stove. Um, we had an outhouse, of course. Uh, no inside plumbing at all. Um, we lived in it. I, I, I would say it was a very poor life that we lived. But you know what? It was so simple. Life was so simple. It was so happy. We lived right next to my grandfather. My grandfather raised everything that he needed. He had a farm. He had a garden. He had an orchard. He had animals. He had horses, cows, chickens, rabbits, pigs, and goats, sheep. They canned all of their fresh uh, vegetables and their fresh fruit. I know when we lived, moved here to Los Lunas, <laughs> uh, we used to love to eat the green apples from the trees, from the orchard. And uh, my grandpa used to shoot up into the air to scare us away from the apple trees. Let those apples grow, he'd yell at us. But everything that he grew, he had a great vineyard, everything that he grew, and all the animals that he raised, all of those were used in those days. One time we were here in Los Lunas and we were at my grandpa's and my grandma was uh, uh, shucking corn. So <laughs> she was shucking the corn and in those days we didn't wear pants. We had to wear dresses. Girls had to wear dresses. and. Um, she said, take these to the cows, which is the, the corn husks. So I put them in my dress to carry them to the cows. Both my sister and I did, Alice and I did. And uh, we were feeding <laughs> the corn husks to the cows. And the cow started eating my dress because all the corn husks were in there. Oh my gosh, we were scared to death. We thought the cows were going to eat us. But <laughs> it was just the corn husks that they were eating. <laughs> we always had to milk the cow, the cow, not the cow. We had to milk the goat. The goat's name was Pancha. And uh, I had to learn how to milk the goat, which was an experience because my grandma used to make the cheese. <laughs> when we lived in Roswell, our neighbors, Danny was one of the neighbors. He was a little boy and everybody, I think mean, he thought he was real cool. So he had a bike. Well, one day he tied a rat to the back of his bike, a rat that they had caught, tied it to the back of his bike and he was riding all over town, 
pulling the rat behind his bike and <laughs> scaring the girls with the rat. That was his thing. You know, he was always after the girls. I don't know what happened to him. We used to love to come and visit Grandma and Grandpa here. We used to love to come. Um, and we'd always, uh, I know my cousins would always tease us because we were from Roswell. In Roswell, they grew cotton. We never smelled the manure and the smells of the country like they do here, like they have here. So uh, our cousins just tease us. And my, I remember my cousin Buddy always used to say, Mmm, that's a, an excellent smell. I love that smell. The smell of the cows and the dairies. Because we'd always say, ooh, 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 that's an awful smell. But he always said, oh, I love that smell. It's such a good smell. And you know, once we moved here, we knew we had to get used to it. But yeah, it was, you know, it's always scary to go to a new place, to go to a new school. Um, we lived by my grandmother and my grandfather, so that was good. You know, that helped us, because uh, we loved coming to visit them on the farm and doing the things that they did on the farm. I remember when I got the penny stuck on the roof of my mouth. Auntie <laughs> Alice was, put me under the faucet. Dad said she was, my dad said she wants water, she wants water because I was going, ah, ah, I couldn't even talk. So uh, he told her, give her water. She took her, she took me, she took me out there under the faucet, put my head under the faucet. Didn't come off. They had to take me to the doctor. So the doctor could pry it off of there. We actually moved around a lot. But we always went to the same school because there was only one. There was only one grade school here. I was already in high school when uh, my mom, mom and dad bought a, bought a home. I was very, uh, I was actually very quiet, very intelligent. Um, I loved school. Um, I thought I was well behaved. <laughs> uh, uh, my older sister was the one that was more mischievous. The younger one was spoiled, she was rotten. Because you know, the older one, she was the first one here. She was the first one to be spoiled. She was the first one. And then the, the younger one, well, that's the baby. And you kind of get overlooked when you're the middle child. <gasps> I remember when uh, Eloise, the youngest one, was <laughs> riding the Shetland pony at my grandpa's. And it was her and two of the other kids and uh, two of the cousins, because all the cousins used to hang around together. And uh, the older cousin was leading the horse while they were climbing a little hill. And my sister fell off. She was in the back. And the other cousin fell on her, and she broke her arm. And it was just, she came running up to my mom and said, Mom, Mom, look at my arm. And it was just hanging. Part of her arm was just hanging. So my mom made a splint. They took her to the doctor and she had to get a cast. But uh, it was kind of funny because, <laughs> because the cousin that fell on it was a little chunky. And she, when she fell on the arm, she broke it. And uh, so we teased her all the time. My younger sister, again, we used to uh, tell her that the moon was a ball. She used to cry. She used to cry for my dad to get her the moon, the ball. Uh, my favorite subject was reading. I love to read. To this day, I love to read. My eyesight is not as good anymore, so I struggle. But Alice got me a Kindle for Christmas a couple of years ago, and that's what I use to read, because I can enlarge the font. I like novels. I like romance novels. I like mystery novels. Um, I like John Grisham. Jackie Collins. I love, I love novels. I, I'm not into history much. I graduated in 1971. I went, uh, I, I uh, studied education. I um, 
wanted to be a teacher. Well, I didn't really want to be a teacher, but my sister Alice, again, went to school the year before me, uh, went to college, and she wanted to be into, she, she got into education, and I just followed her footsteps. No, I don't regret it. It was very rewarding. All the, the children that I see now that are grown up with children of their own, it amazes me. From college, yes, I have a very special friend. We've been friends for over 40 years, 42 years. Sally Proventil. Yeah, we, uh, we met in college, my first year of college. Sally was very caring, very generous, uh, lots of fun to be with. Um, we just hit it off. And uh, since then we started hanging out. We, ha we hung out every day in college. We partied together in college. We just had a blast in college. I, I'll never forget the college years. I remember Sally one time wanting to, uh, she planned a, a surprise birthday party for me. And uh, we lived right off the main street in Silver City because I went to Western New Mexico University. And uh, we lived right off the main street and she was waiting for her income tax to come so that she could buy everything for the party. Well, her income tax didn't come. So uh, that evening before the party, the night before the party, she was standing on the corner there by the Gila Theater, because there was only one theater in town, standing by the theater yelling, bring your own booze, bring your own booze, bring your own booze. And that was probably the best party we ever had. You know, when I went over there, I was very introverted. I got there <laughs> and things changed. I loved to, to party. Um, there were days that we'd go to class and we hadn't slept. Um, we had partied all night. And then we were studying at the last minute, just cramming, trying to get the, the ready for the test the next day. But uh, we made it. I made it through. I graduated from college in 1975. I actually called um, the superintendent, and because I had offers in uh, Nevada and in the East, teaching jobs, and but I didn't want to leave. I wanted to come home. When I called the superintendent, I said I'd rather go home, and he said yes, come. I don't even remember filling out an application, and I got the job. His name was Clory Tafoya. He's long since passed, but I started teaching. My first year was uh, second grade. I taught second grade, and then uh, I went on to fourth grade. I taught fourth grade for many years. Then I went into third grade. I taught third grade probably for five years, and then fifth grade for the rest of my career, and I taught for 25 years. That I always tell this story about this little boy. His name was Marty. And he used to hide all day long, pretending like he was looking in his desk. And I, I'd look around, I'd say, where's Marty? He's right there, Mrs. Diaz. And sure enough, he was hiding because he didn't want to do anything. There was another story, too, about a little boy that wrote, uh, I, I told him to write a scary story for Halloween. So they were writing a scary story, and I said, it has to be at least three-fourths of a page long. You know, it can be longer, but not shorter than three-fourths of a page. Everybody turns in their papers. I was looking them over, and this little boy's paper, it said, uh, once I went into a haunted house, and I saw a ghost, and it said, and the rest of the paper, all I saw in the paper was O's all the way down. And I called this child up and I said, what is this? Well, did you read it, Mrs. Diaz? I said, well, no, I haven't read it yet. Well, read it. Sure enough, it said, I once, once I went into a haunted house and I saw a ghost and it said, ooh, 
all the way down the page. And I said, oh my gosh, I should give him credit for this. But I told him, no, you have to do it over. It has to be words. <laughs> so that I always remember that story. Um, they had to keep themselves entertained. They had to listen. I mean, kids have always been the same. <laughs> you know, school is not their favorite thing. So you have to keep their attention somehow. And you had to think of things that would keep them entertained and excited and just give them that love of knowledge and learning. I remember, I remember I was taking a ballroom dancing and Sally took it too. Oh my gosh. Uh, there was not enough boys, right? There was more girls always in dance class. There's more girls than boys. And uh, so Sally was my partner. She always wanted to be my partner when we danced. And she told me, and you have to be the boy because I can't lead. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was like moving a block. She wouldn't move. She wouldn't move. It was difficult to teach Sally to dance, that's for sure. But it was pretty hysterical. <laughs> My best friend and my partner always was Eva Gurule, but she's since passed. We had a very close relationship, very close friendship. We hung around all the time. Um, her husband and uh, my husband were friends. We uh, used to go out together. We used to go dancing. We used to go to concerts. We used to uh, enjoy. A, a social life. Eva was very, uh, she was a good person. She, she always tried to help everybody. She was very fair and honest. Um, we loved being together. We spent all our time together. I miss her. I met um, Harvey in 1975, right, right when I got out of college. I met him at a local bar here. It's not even there anymore. It's a church now. Um, I used to take my aunts. They were older ladies. I'd take them dancing on Saturday nights. And uh, I was with them, and I met him at the club. It was a bar. It was called Rocco's. <laughs> and so we started hanging out there. and. Uh, we danced the first time, and since then, we were together all the time. Uh, Harv was very personable. People just loved him, no matter where we went. He knew somebody, or someone knew him. He talked to everybody that he saw. He never saw a stranger. Um, he was loved by everybody that met him. We. We'd go to the, the Tiracos and we'd dance. We'd dance, we'd have drinks. Um, he had a, a best friend, his name was Benny. And Benny went with us everywhere. And Sally went with us too, because she moved down here. <laughs> so we had Benny and Sally with us all the time. You know, I couldn't picture myself with anybody else. He was good to me. Um, I saw the way he was with his mom, with his family. He was just a good person. A little time to warm up to you. She took a little time to warm up to me because that was her baby boy. And she didn't want to give him up. Uh, she really, uh, it was rough. I didn't think they liked me at all for a long time. Her, his sister and his mom. Oh, just the things that they would say. She'd always, uh, his mom always had to throw in a dig about something. No matter what you did, she had to say something. It was like she'd give you something and then take it away from you. You know what? I don't actually think it was a proposal. He just gave me a ring. And we just took it for granted that we were going to get married. I don't remember him uh, getting on a knee or saying, will you marry me or... He just gave me an engagement ring. We married, I think it was 76. 
because I had been teaching for a year, we had lived together for a while. We had lived together for a while, and then uh, we decided to get married. <laughs> and at our wedding, they stole our cake. <laughs> we, we had an open bar, uh, you know, they had food, they had music, they had dancing, they, and then somebody ended up stealing the wedding cake. So nobody got cake. All we got was the little top part with the bride and the groom. That's what they left us. Well, somebody enjoyed a good wedding cake. <laughs> Since the first time that Harv went over, um, he had dinner with us. And the first, <laughs> the first time, uh, him and my younger sister, Eloise, got in a fight over the plate. They wanted to use the same plate. And she just didn't like him at all. And my dad just loved him. My mom had already passed, so she never got to meet him. My dad just loved him. So from that day on, since the first day he ate in our house, we never had dinner without Harvey. My dad would say, well, isn't Harvey coming? Isn't Harvey coming? So we'd wait for him to get there. Sir. We were married 34 years before he passed away. He passed away three years ago, um, September 21st, 2010. Uh, he had been very ill. He was tired. He had already, uh, he had told me already, I'm tired. I'm tired. And his mom passed several years before that, and he was dreaming about his mom calling him. I told him, no, uh, you're too important to too many people. You can't leave us. And uh, we just found him. One day he was on oxygen 24-7, and uh, I woke up, it was the middle of the night, and uh, the oxygen hose was on the bed. He hadn't taken it, but he wasn't there. So I went to look for him, and I said, what are you doing, babe? I went to check, and he was already dead. I uh, ran to my son's room, and I said, Jer, Jer, something's wrong with Dad. I got scared, but I knew he was already cold. His body was already cold. and. Uh, he went in there, he tried to do CPR. He was already gone. The paramedics came, they tried CPR, they tried chest compressions, they tried everything they could and they couldn't bring him back. I don't know how long he was without his oxygen. Got it. Definitely. In fact, even today, three years, you know, three years later I'm still saying, Oh, when I hear something, oh, I got to tell Harp, you know, because he's the one, he was my partner. We did everything together. He's the one I used to say, tell everything to, um, or, or I'd hear something funny and I'd want to tell him. Uh, and you get so used to someone, it's hard to let go. We had planned on having kids. Uh, in fact, but Patricia and Jer are seven years apart. And uh, we didn't think that we were going to have another one after Patricia. But, you know, Jeremy came along and I had my girl and my boy. My father passed away when Jeremy was six months old. So it was 26 years ago. So Jeremy never knew my dad. Patricia knew her grandpa, but Jeremy didn't. Patricia is, uh, Patricia is a very intelligent child. She was a very intelligent child. She did so well in school until she turned 14 or 15, and that's when the bottom fell out of the pot because she just fell apart. Uh, she met uh, the people that lived, our neighbors were kind of wild and she liked that wild life. And since then, she started running around, she started running away from home. 
um, hanging around with the wrong people. Um, it was it was horrible. And to this day, um, she has four children. She's given me four beautiful grandchildren. Nicholas, and he's 11. Kiana, and she is nine. Adrian, he's eight. And Leah, she's six. And uh, she has been in and out of trouble since she was 15 years old. Um, and I, I feel so badly about that because I feel like her children need her in their lives. What kind of child was she? Was Patricia? Yeah. Oh, Patricia was a happy child. Loving, caring, always happy, very social. Um, she did well in everything that she did. I feel like we probably should have been more strict with her. I feel like, because we uh, planned, uh, I mean several times, we wanted to put her into, a, it was like a rehab, a home, to see if she could get some help. And um, we always backed out, because she always talked us out of it. And we lived in hope, thinking that one day things would change. And right now, she's in prison. The children are with their father, except for Nicholas. He's here with us. And um, I do feel like we could have done things differently. Alice has two children, Carmen and Charity. Charity is the older one. She is into culinary arts, excellent cook, excellent baker. Carmen is the younger, my younger niece, and she uh, has two children, Reuben and Ava. Carmen, uh, Carmen has always been a handful. <laughs> Charity is very loving and very likable. Everybody loves Charity. Everybody wants to hang around with Charity. She's fun. <laughs> I remember uh, Charity when she was little. Sometimes she'd stay with us and she would, uh, if I was mad at my husband, Charity would be mad at him too. And she, <laughs> he always remembered that she used to walk into the living room, get a candy from the candy dish, and turn around, give him a dirty look, and turn around and walk away because we were mad at him. <laughs> Uh, Eloise has two children, Angelo and Stephanie. Of Angelo and Stephanie, both of them love to tease. They love to tease people about lots of different things. And uh, they love to laugh and they uh, love their families. Uh, Stephanie's a hard worker. Um, they have a good work ethic. Both of them do. One time, uh, <laughs> one time, uh, Angelo's grandpa gave him a cantaloupe that he had grown in his garden. And uh, my husband said, let's cut the cantaloupe. And uh, so they cut the cantaloupe, right, so we could have cantaloupe. And uh, Angelo started crying, don't cut my rock. Don't cut my rock. I thought that was hilarious. Okay, my uh, daughter was went into labor, and uh, we were we had already planned on we were going to take care of Nicholas, the oldest one, and uh, while she went to the hospital. Well, they got to the house, and uh, she was in labor. She was she was already happy that baby. And um, so John, her husband, called 911. So the 911 operator was giving him instructions on what to do. So they said, well, have her mom 
check to see if the baby's head is showing. You know, pull down her pants and check to see if the baby's head is showing. She was still in the car at this time because they were on their way to the hospital. And I checked, I pulled down her pants to see if the baby's head was showing and the baby came out right into my arms. It just came out. So uh, uh, the ambulance, that, by that time the ambulance showed up but the baby was already here and they ended up taking her to the hospital with the umbilical cord still attached. And we actually filmed a documentary on that. Um, it was called The Driveway Baby because she was born in our driveway in our front yard. And uh, we had, we actually played our, ourselves in the documentary. Was that difficult for you? It was kind of difficult, the documentary, because we had to, uh, I remember we, they were trying to film the sunset behind us and walking with the babies up to the, to the house and they couldn't get the sun right. And then uh, some of the things like I had to get gold because they wanted us to reenact exactly what happened. So they were sending me into the bathroom to get towels and the cameraman was there looking at me and I kept looking at him, I guess, and they kept saying, no, you can't look at me, I'm not supposed to be here. And I had to do that three or four times, that shot, going in to get the towels from the bathroom I had to do it three or four times. I said, what, am I retarded that I can't, <laughs> I can't go in and get some towels? I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and then to watch the video after, we had a, a party at our house when it came out on Amazing Babies. Uh, we had a party at our house and it was about six minutes long. It was a short one, but uh, it was just, it was exciting. We showed it to everybody. She came out on the paper. It was a big deal. <laughs> it's taught me patience. Um, it's taught me a love that you can't even imagine. Because those children are just, they're my joy. They're my life. They bring me happiness. I enjoy them. My husband always used to say, if I had known, if I had known that uh, grandchildren were so cool, I would have had them before I had my kids. And I mean, four children is a lot to deal with, but you know, I don't regret any of them. I think they're all happy. They've all, all had their, uh, uh, rough spots in their life, but they're happy children, basically. Okay, they lived with me for, uh, they lived with us for three years. When my husband passed away, um, their father took them and uh, dropped them off at the services and never came back for them. It gave my uh, son a lot of responsibility um, because my husband was ill, so he did everything for the children. He cooked for them. My son did. He cooked for them. He drove them where they had to go. Uh, he took them to school. Uh, he made sure they got up in the morning. He made sure they got dressed. He, he basically took care of them. He took the father's role in their lives. I have uh, renal failure. I'm on dialysis. I have been on dialysis for 17 years. Um, when I first got ill, I was in denial. I didn't realize I would, I, I'm the kind of person that no matter what I persevere, I keep going, I keep going. And um, I didn't want to admit that there was anything wrong with me. I went to the doctor and he did a blood test and he said there's something wrong with your kidneys but it had been eight years since he had done a blood test so i went to a nephrologist which is a kidney specialist and um, he said you're going to be on dialysis i didn't even know what dialysis was it was something completely foreign to me and um, 
I started learning about it. I had taught for 23 years when I was diagnosed with the kidney failure, so I wanted to put in at least 25 years to get a decent retirement. So I uh, taught for two years while I was on dialysis. As soon as uh, the bell would ring, I'd walk out the door um, and I'd go to the dialysis clinic in, uh, uh, on Gibson in Albuquerque and uh, drive myself there, drive myself back, and go to school the next day. I could never match a cadaver uh, donor for a kidney because my antibodies were so high. So my only chance would have been a living donor. And I just feel like it's too huge a thing to ask. Very talented. She's a singer. She plays a guitar. Um, she sings Spanish music, but beautiful. She has a beautiful voice. I remember when she was first starting. Oh my goodness, it wasn't that good. I mean, she was starting to, she was just learning to play the guitar, just learning to uh, sing, you know. And she wasn't. She was. She did a lot of yelling in those days in her singing, but she has improved so much. In fact, she's very well known in the area. Um, I love Se Me Olvido Otra Vez. I forgot again. Um, another one is uh, Amarga Navidad, which is uh, a bitter Christmas. Beautiful, beautiful song. Um, there's quite a few of them. And she sings all of the old uh, <coughs> songs. A lot of the old songs, I think that's what people love. My favorite music is Spanish. In fact, my son used to love Spanish until he got older, because that's what we listened to all the time. And then he got older and he didn't want to listen to Spanish anymore. Uh, do you know which one? <sighs> Un puño de tierra. And that means, because he'd always say that was his song, that uh, when you die, the only thing you're going to take with you is a handful of dirt, nothing else. Un puño de tierra. Okay, Jeremy. Jeremy is my rock. And you know, Jeremy has always been with mom. I tell you, we used to do everything together. Jeremy was with me all the time, all the time. Um, he's always been good in school. He was intelligent. He loved drama, loves drama. Um, he had lots of friends and he loved bringing his friends to the house and they enjoyed being there and the house was always full of, of laughter and love and happiness and um, all his friends there all the time, they'd come to eat, they'd come to visit, they'd, uh, hung, they hung around all the time, they took him to the prom when he was in ninth grade, you know, he just, his high school years were really, really nice. He had a good time in high school. Had lots of good friends. Um, he's now, I think he's taken on the responsibility of, of raising my grandchildren. For three years he did for sure. And uh, now they're with their dad, but now he takes the responsibility of raising Nicholas. He's the father figure in Nicholas's life. Very responsible very helpful. He helps me with everything. Yeah, 60 is a, a rough age. I think the worst age for me was, once you get to 30, that's rough. 40 is really bad. And after that, it's like, what do you do? You get older, you have to accept it. But um, yeah, 60 was um, my son, my sister, my nieces and nephews, 
gave me a surprise 60th birthday party. It was the most exciting thing. Uh, they had mariachis, they had good food, they had um, pictures of from my life. It was just amazing the things that they did. It was, and I was surprised because they were telling me all along that it was a birthday party for my niece. And here I was getting all ready to go to the birthday party for my niece. I, <laughs> I even bought her a gift. Walked into the um, venue where they were where they were having the party, and uh, everybody yelled surprise. And I said, No, it's not for me. It's not for me. And because I and then I thought I looked around because I thought Stephanie, my niece, was behind me, the one that the birthday party was supposed to be for. And she wasn't behind me. And the birthday party was for me. It was just a total surprise. I had no idea. The kids didn't give it away. Of course, they didn't know about it till the last minute because they were afraid they were going to give it away. And uh, the kids didn't give it away. No, Jeremy didn't give, away, give it away. They were out working on everything they had to work on several nights with my niece and my sister. and. I didn't even know. I didn't even realize. I had no idea. No idea. It was an exciting, pleasant surprise. Something I'll never forget. I'm looking forward to seeing my grandchildren grow up and become responsible adults. Uh, I don't know if I'll see that in my lifetime, but um, I'm hoping to at least see them get older and be able to uh, see them deal with life. Um, I want their mom in their lives. You know, I've always felt that compassion is so important. You need to be compassionate. You need to feel for other people. You need to help as many people as you can. I've always based my life on that. I always feel like uh, being friendly and smiling and loving and caring and just enjoying. And always, and, and another thing I've tried to tell them is education is so important. It is so important in their lives. That's the only All way they're going to get anywhere done. in this world Give me power. is to be educated and do well. I think that everybody has regrets. Um, You know, I just, I feel like I had a full life. I did, I do. I have a full life, even now. You know, although we grew up very poorly, we didn't, my parents never had much money. Um, there was always love and happiness in our home. I hope I pass that on to my children and to my grandchildren. I want them to enjoy life. Um, I want their lives to be happy. I want them to work hard. I want them to uh, be good people. And family is the most important thing to me.
so many times, but you will uh, Be through. strong with your convictions. Work hard. Do the best you can at everything you attempt. I can live without you. Enjoy your family, enjoy your brothers, your sisters. Enjoy life, Nick. When I feel scared And you are the only one who knows just what to say baby. And so here do I But I thank you And so here